Right. We are live. Hey everybody, it's Cheryl Lawson here hanging out with Daniel Maloney from Pen League. Hey and everyone. Joining us uh, in a couple couple of weeks for a social media Tulsa conference. Hey Daniel. Hi, how is it going? Hey, do you prefer Daniel or Danny? Either way works. I'll answer <laughs> that. Whatever you want to call me. Works okay. Really. Just, just let me know so I know to respond. Right. Well, I tend to talk call people by their uh, Twitter handles. <laughs> yep. So that, you're probably going to be Daniel P. Maloney. <laughs> all right, and that's my Pinterest handle too. So it works. Oh well, perfect, perfect. <laughs> and since we're going to be talking Pinterest, I think that I think that's great. So you know, we're going to talk Pinterest and Pin League and Social Media Tulsa Conference. But I mean, to start out with. Um, I guess you probably saw Facebook made a bunch of changes today to the timeline, which are very big image, you know, big image savvy. So I think you know what we're talking about today probably has had some influence on their decision of late with images. Uh, but why do you think Pinterest? I know Pinterest has been around for a little while, longer than it exploded. But why did it just go crazy? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a good question. I think there were a lot of factors building up to it because it was one of those things where like Pinterest was one of the you know it was an overnight success story and people pointed to it being the fastest site ever to get to 10 million users but the reality is that even depends on when you start measuring from because it took a long time and it took a pivot or two in order to get to Pinterest as Pinterest is today so you know in some ways nothing really pops up overnight like that um, but they had a lot of momentum building within their community and so I think it was a mix of Great product. Uh, there were just the natural network effects and the explosive, the explosiveness um, that comes with a product that naturally has a strong viral coefficient built in. But then on top of that, I think they benefited from really serving a need in the market at a time when other people weren't. And so they got a lot of press and publicity in part because they were doing something that the Facebooks and Twitters of the world had failed to accomplish up to that point, and they were really hitting on a nerve. Then you you know you throw in this concept of them being the fastest site ever to 10 million. All of a sudden, the media frenzy blows up, and next thing you know, they go from 10 million to 25 million monthly uniques in a matter of months, right? Uh, so you know it, it, that media coverage definitely helped, I think, grow trial for them. So you had a lot of first-time users trying the platform, some of whom didn't stick around, and it just wasn't for them yet, or the right content wasn't for them. But in my mind, what's more interesting is even after that hyper growth in early 2012 and, and late 2011 died off um, and they returned to sort of, sort of more of a natural growth level, they're still growing really quickly and now they announced that they've topped over 50 million monthly uniques. And so to me that staying power is what's interesting, much more so than the first 10 million in right. time. Yeah, because I think you know a lot of sites, and we probably can name them all who reached those those numbers, and they are no longer no longer around. So their sustainability has been as remarkable as their I think quick growth, right? Right. Yeah, so, and I, and I think okay. of it for for startups. It's like you've got the threshold for a lot of types of startups where it's like you know the thousand user mark, the hundred thousand user mark, the million user mark, the ten million. But in my mind, to really be a mainstream platform, you've got to break the 20, 25 million monthly active unique users. And once you break that, that uh, plateau, uh, I think you're here to stay. And so I think what Pinterest is showing and their recent $200 million round is showing is that they've definitely gotten not only to that plateau but much higher. And now the question in my mind is when do they reach $100 million? And long term, is it the type of platform that caps out at 100, 150 million users, or is it the type of platform that can go to a billion users the way Facebook has? Um, in which case, they've probably got to get into some additional use cases and you know, broader use in terms of what the site is for. But uh, I, I think they've got a lot of growth left in them. Right. I mean, I I do. I think they're really getting started, and um, I know people who spend a lot of time on Pinterest. I, I don't spend as much time there as I probably should or because um, it, it seems like if, I know most of my friends <laughs> will tell you once you're there it's hard to get out right yeah that's true that's very <laughs> it's very addictive <laughs> it, 
So uh, I think, you know, uh, what you're doing now, the one thing I think that might bring me to Pinterest more often is the analytics and the data, the kind of stuff that you, you're doing at Pin League. So tell me about Pin League and um, how you started that and kind of a little bit about what it does. Sure. I mean, I think the way we started it is that it, we were almost from a business perspective an early power user of Pinterest. So uh, my co-founder Alex and I actually began the company building a completely different product. We were building bridesview.com, which was essentially a visual wedding planning site where you could go through and pick out the photos you like from other people's weddings and then use that information to find service providers and buy products that you wanted for your own wedding. Um, which we started getting some good traction on, but it was kind of, uh, you know, Q4 of 2011, which coincided pretty well with Pinterest's growth explosion. Uh, we began seeing that our traffic from Pinterest was naturally growing very rapidly along with Pinterest's own growth. And, you know, at the time, granted, it was still less than 1% of our referrals, but when we looked at it month over month, we were saying, wow, something's happening here in Pinterest. So the beginning of our technology was actually built to serve our own needs because we were looking at it saying, okay, we're a bridal site. A lot of women were using Pinterest to plan their weddings. How do we go and find every bride-to-be who's using Pinterest, lean into that platform, engage them organically with good quality content, convert them into followers, then eventually convert them into users of our platform? And that was where we got our, our spark on the Pinterest side uh, so what happened was, you know, fast forward a few months, we had some good success there. About 30% or so of our referrals were coming from Pinterest at that point. So it really did explode. Um, and I think we benefited from being well aligned with one of the early Pinterest categories as well. Uh, but, you know, from there what happened was we frankly just started telling our friends about the success we were having, recommending that they try Pinterest as well. And they said, oh, I like that technology you've built. Could you do that for... E-commerce site. Can you do that for a site targeting new moms? Can you do that for a technology blog? And all of a sudden, you know, the light bulb went off for us. Hey, this is going to be a major platform. Why don't we take the technology we built for ourselves, platformize it, and make it generalized so that any business could use it? Um, and that was really the start of Pin League. So, you know, at this point, that's a little over a year ago. Yeah. And the last year, um, it seems like it's come by like a blur. <laughs> it, it feels like all that happened like four days ago, but it's actually been a year. Uh, but we, we were almost forced into the pivot by the market in a way, and it turned out to be a, a good pivot, I think, also. That, that's crazy. And then and then you moved to Oklahoma, which, you know, benefits yep. all of us. <laughs> so yeah, we, exactly. We get the uh, knowledge that you that you created in right here in our backyard, so that's that's pretty awesome. So you know, for me, Pinterest, because I, I teach a class in, at UC Riverside in California, um, social media marketing, and the last class I taught was back in last April. So I think Pinterest was just, that's when the media storm was really starting to, to come on. And I always talk about images in social and that kind of thing. And so um, I think Instagram and Pinterest were just really hot at the time. And so I was playing around with Pinterest and I created this board that I used to describe what I thought at the time Pinterest was and it was called Cupcakes, Diamonds and Shoes. <laughs> and, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and so and to this date that is my most popular <laughs> that is my Probably. most popular board on Pinterest. And I get more repins from stuff I put in that board. And I still every now and again if I see a cool cupcake or diamond <laughs> or shoe I'm throwing it in that board. Right. But I know that there are more um, business cases and people who are just rocking Pinterest from a brand perspective. Do you have any examples of maybe a brand that's just knocking Pinterest out of the park? Yeah, I think there are a number of them, actually. Uh, you know, a minority, but a number of them. Uh, and I guess the other thing I want to caveat this with is knocking Pinterest out of the park is also probably relative because you know, the, t the tendency is point to the brands that have massive followings and they're huge brand names anyway and they're known nationally if not internationally. But the reality is what we're also seeing is a lot of small businesses who in their mind are knocking it out of the park on Pinterest because they're getting three times as much referral traffic from Pinterest as they are from Facebook or because they're you know, just generating a strong ROI on direct sales online 
And for a smaller business, you don't need a million followers to knock it out of the park. Like right. 500 might be enough. Uh, and I'm noticing a lot of people tying their Etsy accounts with their Pinterest accounts yeah. and just finding more success that way. Yeah, I can't tell you how many Etsy sellers we've had sign up for Pin League over wow. time. I mean, you know, quite a few. Uh, and you know, that's uh, it's a community that's a natural fit for Pinterest. So you do have, and that you know, that's a small business in itself. In some cases, it's just one sales channel for a larger small business. Um, so you've got those types of folks who are knocking it out of the park. And I've, to give you a sense of the range I've heard there, everything from real estate agents to concrete companies to food insurance companies to antique, you know, e-commerce companies. Uh, we've got someone using Pin League, uh, Minimus.biz, a really cool company. They sell little travel-sized and individual use-sized versions of basically everything on Earth. Um, and they're, they're seeing return on Pinterest. So you've got a lot of businesses that aren't in those intuitive Pinterest categories that are knocking it out of the park within their niche. That said, when you look at the bigger brands, I think there are some people doing really interesting things. So um, I dropped in the chat, and maybe when there are blog posts associated with this video, we'll share some of these links. But up on the Pin League blog, there are a few infographics that call out segment by segment who's knocking it out of the park. So one that I grabbed was luxury fashion brands. We have another one that's kind of like fashion retailers. Uh, we have one for fast casual restaurants. Um, and category by category, you have brands that are really nailing it. So in the fast casual space, for example, Panera has done a really good job generating content that's genuinely interesting to their audience. So, so uh, I'm sharing uh, my screen. So is this one sure. of the? Yeah. That's so, a, that's actually a different infographic. Oh. If you click on the the third link, that's the luxury fashion brands infographic. Oh, perfect. Uh, that'll pull up one of them. Uh, is that the third link? That's, oh, that's that might be the fourth one. Oh. <laughs> I just assumed there were three. Oh, there we go. Luxury. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> that'll get it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, within this infographic, uh -huh. it'll be further down. So here you see brands like Burberry and Dior and Gucci that are really getting a lot of traction. And what we look at when we look at these brands is a couple of things. First is we don't just look at the followers uh, because in many cases the brands that have a lot of followers, and I'm talking hundreds of thousands or millions of followers, mm -hmm. have that follower count because they were promoted and recommended accounts on Pinterest. And so when you actually look into their engagement numbers, generally speaking, those brands have much lower engagement per follower than some of the ones that got there organically without being promoted by Pinterest. Mm -hmm. So we do look at the follower counts to find out kind of who the big ones are, but then what also is on this infographic is engagement rates. So wow. how many repins per pin are they getting? Now, what percentage of their pins are repinned a hundred times or more? You know, those types of metrics tell us who's really uh, doing, you know, doing a really great job of generating the right type of content. And that's when you see brands like Anthropology, for example, doing a great job. Whereas in the same category, and you know, of course, not to pick on them, I actually think they're doing a good job too. But LL Bean happens to have a lot more followers because they were promoted, but they don't have the same type of follower engagement rates. Um, but that said, they're still doing interesting things. Uh, apart from those metrics, I really like other types of brands that are using Pinterest from a brand communication perspective. Uh, so Whole Foods comes to mind in this category where they didn't go onto Pinterest and say, we're just going to pin everything in our stores and try to sell more of our stuff and advertise it. They took the approach more of, we want to use Pinterest to communicate what our brand stands for and to connect with our customer based on shared values and, and shared characteristics. So they have boards about living green and about self-empowerment. And you know, those types of, uh, of, of characteristics that they view as an essential part of their brand and of their customer demographic. So I think that's a really cool use of Pinterest that doesn't really work as well on a Facebook or a Twitter, but this visual platform that Pinterest is is much better suited for it. Right, because you can have a wind technology and uh, you know the uh, um, smart cars and things like yeah. that wouldn't necessarily relate to what they're selling or what Whole Foods is about but that's kind of this the type of thing they want you to think about 
when you think about their brand. I think that's really smart. Exactly. Yeah. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you do have the brands that are killing it from an e-commerce and straight, you know, sell-through uh, you know, perspective. And so we've got a number of e-commerce companies that we're working with that are using our campaign products and, and other products and really driving meaningful sales on Pinterest because the virality that Pinterest brings them, it's like all of a sudden new audiences are exposed to their products. They're exposed in an organic way where people are naturally discovering the products that they want. Um, and the other really cool thing and, and why I think the analytics starts becoming so powerful is as a marketer you can learn a lot about consumer intent both at a, an aggregate level and at an individual level to the point where you could literally use these types of analytics to identify customers who are planning on buying things from your competitor and go and swoop in and propose a similar product you have with a 10% discount coupon and take that business away. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, those types of things are possible on Pinterest in a way that they're just not really uh, as possible on Facebook or Twitter. Right, because because you could actually take somebody who, you know, to me, I think it's it it just speaks volume for brands when somebody can go to your website or uh, go to another website about your product and pin it into a board that says, "I want this," yes. <laughs> right? or this exactly. is my this is my style, right? <laughs> And I, I want and my style are two of the most common board names on Pinterest. Wow. Uh, and so literally you have millions of boards with those types of titles that are people telling you, I want this item, <laughs> right? Help me get it. Help me find it. Exactly. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's unbelievable because as a loyal Facebook user, a loyal Twitter user, I would never really share the same type of content on those platforms that I share on Pinterest because they just don't, the platforms don't serve the same purpose at the end of the day. Right. And so that's why when I look at Facebook making changes to be more Pinterest-like, I kind of look back to whatever it was, three, four years ago, when Twitter started taking off and all of a sudden Pinterest was focusing more on the news feed and making it more real-time and status I mean, updating. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like all, Facebook became Twitterified in a way. Right. But at the end of the day, Twitter kept growing like crazy and mm -hmm. has become a massive platform. And I think the same thing is going to happen here, where Facebook is learning from Pinterest, which is good for Facebook. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, they're never going to solve that same use case that Pinterest has already solved. Right. Uh, and so I, I don't see Facebook's changes as slowing down Pinterest growth at all. I think it's more uh, maximizing Facebook's value of their own traffic um, based on the model they already have by taking cues from Pinterest. Right. And Google Plus and Twitter yeah. and just about everybody. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, just about everybody. I'm not sure Facebook has had an original right. thought in a while, but hey, you know, if yeah. you you know, if that's that's another business model, you know, take what else is successful and add it into right. your so uh, although to be fair, I think Facebook was and uh, first of all it probably still is, but was the first massive photo sharing platform. Nah. The, the difference, and why I think actually the Instagram acquisition made more sense for Facebook than the Pinterest acquisition would have made at the time, is that Facebook photo sharing and Instagram photo sharing are more focused on personal images from your real life. Right. And Pinterest, by you know, complete, the, the complete contrary, Pinterest isn't really about real life. Pinterest is about aspiration. It's about the life you want to have which makes it much more interesting to a marketer because it's pre-purchase, it's intent driven, it's aspirationally driven, it's positive and so forth. Um, but you know, you can't take a platform that is just geared for private and personal sharing and suddenly pivot it to the point where you're gonna expect people are sharing with the same volume of you know commercial interest that they do on Pinterest. Right. I mean, you know, for for most people hitting the like button on Facebook exposes too much but you know but on Pinterest there's no hesitation to say this is my style or I want this or you know this is into my you know favorite shoe category and I, I just really think that there you know there's a distinction between the two and of course that's that's good you know there's room enough for everybody right well, well and I think in a way also part of why there's not that hesitance uh, on Pinterest is it's not driven by your real life social graph the way that Facebook is. I mean, sure, I have friends who are following me on Pinterest, 
but on Facebook, the vast majority of my interactions are with people I know or that I know tangentially or you know at least somewhat through business or through you know their their Pinley customers and we engage through Facebook. So you know that's the the crowd that I'm engaging with on Facebook, and I know whatever I post on Facebook could have real life consequences, so to speak. Mm -hmm. On Pinterest, I'm engaging much more with people, and granted, they're real people in the real world, but they're people that I'm engaging with based on shared interests, and I might never meet them, um, almost the way that uh, chat rooms and, and forums grew up in the early web, that anonymity, um, without being pure anonymity, um, in a way, empowers you to share more of your aspirations and to represent the person you want to be more as opposed to who you are because you're not going to get called out the next day for it. So right. uh, yeah, I, I think that, that that's a fundamental difference as well. And personally, I think there's a lot of power in that. Now, I don't know, you know, from Pinterest's own roadmap, maybe they want to get more into the social graph, maybe they don't. Um, but I believe that leaning more into the interest graph concept instead of the social graph concept is ultimately going to lead them to have a much more unique and interesting business that's going to be far more valuable instead of trying to compete with Facebook, where Facebook already owns the social graph. Absolutely. You're absolutely right on that one. I, I agree with you on that. So now, a lot of people who uh, will be coming to our conference and probably watching this are um, bloggers, uh, you know, service providers, people who are consultants, and maybe even a few nonprofit organizations who mm -hmm. not, don't necessarily have a product but have a service to sell and some you know some level of interest how would how would you say they should be involved in Pinterest and then what do they measure yep. yeah I think it's different for each of those audiences so I'll start backwards let's start with the nonprofits because we've okay. actually done some interesting case studies with nonprofits um, and I've had directors of nonprofits talk to me and say um, we want to use Pinterest we're not really sure how and then we start digging into the dynamics of their specific organization and in a lot of cases what you find is at the end of the day donor relations drives the success of a lot of nonprofits. Mm -hmm. um, granted they've got to execute on their mission and that's incredibly important but if they can't get the, fi the funding that they need year after year that's a problem and so where some nonprofits are finding a lot of success with Pinterest in particular is using it as a way to deepen the relationship with their donors uh, so for example where, where we've used this concept uh, is we have a product called Pinmail that can enable you to take your email list and target users based on what social networks they use and what their interests are. So a nonprofit like that, we could help analyze their list, say, hey, out of your 1.2 million donors last year, or your 12 donors, you know, whatever it is, right. uh, this group is using Pinterest and this is what they're generally interested in. Go start building boards related to those categories that still fit with your mission and build boards related to your mission and then we're going to run pin mail campaigns which are email campaigns using the social data to target the content in order to get those users engaged with your profile get your donors to follow you and now you've got this great new channel for impacting and influencing donors throughout the entire year instead of having to send expensive direct mail campaigns right. uh, so I mean that's for nonprofits one specific example um, there are also some really interesting examples, and you can you can search for these on Google later. But um, examples where nonprofits have used Pinterest in interesting ways to get the word out about their cause. And so, like one of my favorite ones was the example of, yeah, given that Pinterest is so consumer oriented, uh, one nonprofit that created sort of the boards that are common on Pinterest, like the I Want board for a fictional young girl in Africa and what she wanted was running water and shoes yeah. um, but not shoes in the sense of stiletto heels, shoes in the sense of I need shoes period. Right. Um, and so that was a really clever way to kind of flip the platform a little bit mm -hmm. naturally not everyone can do that because like you know the first agency or the first agency slash nonprofit to do that gets a lot of press and after that it's kind of like a also done type right. of situation yeah. um, but I think there are ways to just use it for general awareness um, so uh, another great example of that is the Humane Society, who's having a lot of success on Pinterest because people love pinning and repinning photos of adorable puppies and kittens, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a natural fit again, but they can share those photos in a way that still gets their message across and reminds people to support the Humane Society. Uh, ah. So, so nonprofits. I guess I, I said a lot about that category. 
when it comes to the social media consultants and the and you know smaller agencies, um, then you're getting into more of a B2B realm. And so what I've seen is most effective so far in the B2B space on Pinterest is using it to support your content marketing initiatives and to establish your expertise. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's actually the primary objective. Um, there are some really creative, I think, uh, service providers and agencies out there who are using Pinterest to actually work with their clients in real time, to share ideas back and forth, to share mock-ups, uh, design implementations, and so forth. And the interesting thing about that is future clients or people who are prospecting or you know might come across their uh, Pinterest boards because they search for their agency name or whatever it is. Right. Um, all of a sudden, they have a view into their creative process and how they work that previously would have been impossible. Right. Um, so I think that type of openness is a really interesting development. But uh, I can tell you how we use Pinterest at Pinleague is you know a few things, but predominantly what we found is our market is interested in digital marketing, social marketing, internet marketing. And we share a lot of infographics and interesting articles and tips in those categories. We also promote our blog posts. So we've got blog posts now, a couple of the ones, the links even on the side there, um, some of those have hundreds of pins, uh, unique pins um, wow. on their images. So uh, we've gotten some really good traction on Pinterest by sharing infographics and just blog posts generally. But the other thing we want to do is take that Whole Foods approach and show people who we are as a company, mm -hmm. especially because you know being a digital business where someone can just sign up and you know they might never talk to us, they might never meet us in person, unfortunately. Um, we want to let them know that we're real people and that we're a real company and let them know what our company stands for. So we've got a board called Our Philosophy that has pins related to how we think about ourselves as a company. Um, each of our you know first five team members has their own board on Pinterest expressing their own personality. So when people get emails or call in and it's Jessica or Melissa or Alex or John on the phone, they're going to know who those people are and that they are real people. Mm -hmm. uh, so we look at those types of uses of Pinterest as well to give kind of a behind-the-scenes look inside this you know, exciting startup environment. Right. Oh, I, th I think that's really neat. In fact, I do get the, I signed up for Pin League. I'm, I'm probably not using it anywhere near as effectively as I should. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that leads me into the kind of next question is, as an event person, I did create a Tulsa board. Mm -hmm. And then invited people to pin to the board, right? So right. you know, kind of some hey, share your memories, kind of thing. But as a, do you see any event people? You know, Twitter's really big in events now. Google Plus is kind of getting into that with people sharing photos. Of course, uh, in Instagram is really good with hashtagging because that's a way to uh, share photos. Are there any event people or conferences doing anything like that for Pinterest, or is that even possible? It's definitely possible. Um, not enough of them are doing it. And granted, I you know I think people might uh, they're not really sure how to approach it yet. But I've spoken at I don't know maybe a dozen or so conferences in the past year. And every time I go to one, I talk to the organizer and I say I want to help you get up and running on Pinterest. It's not going to necessarily help you know, drive more people to your conference next month. But the conferences you have you know four, six, eight, twelve months from now. I promise you, you're going to be getting additional signups and additional traction because you've built up subject matter expertise and you've built a relationship with people over time. Right. So when I think about event organizers in particular, I think one of the big challenges of that business is that events happen periodically. You know, if you're a big one, you might be doing an event every month or every other month. But a lot of event organizers, it's once a year, twice a year, maybe once a quarter, mm -hmm. and a lot of times those events are in different cities so now you're talking about different local and regional audiences and it's just such a long period between uh, crunch time sign up periods right mm -hmm. where you've got to somehow maintain a relationship with your past attendees to remind them you're out there so that they're going to be so excited about that next event the way people are about South by Southwest right, right. Um, and so that's where I think the big opportunity is for event organizers is to take that longer term view and say, I'm going to start building on Pinterest now so that, I mean, because why do people come to the event in the first place? Usually it's great content and great networking. Right. So how do you take those two concepts and bring them to Pinterest? Well, one, share great content all year round. 
share content that's related to the topics you're going to discuss in the conference and build up the audience so that by the time they see the agenda for the next conference, it's a no-brainer they want to be there because they're interested in five of the categories on the agenda and they're great speakers that they've read blog posts from throughout the year, right? right. So that's one avenue. The second, I think, is to maintain that community. Because uh, I've been to some conferences where, you know, I mean, some of them, it's, it's, you don't get as much of this, but the ones that are my favorite are the ones where people really get to know each other and you leave feeling like you didn't just make 12 contacts, you made 12 friends by the time you've left, right? right. And I want to keep engaging with those people, but it's kind of hard throughout the year, and sure, we exchange business cards and this, that, and the other. Why not build collaborative boards based on your, you know, inviting your past attendees to continue mm -hmm. contributing based on what they think is interesting throughout the year. Now you as the organizer don't have to keep you know, the, the responsibility of generating all the content, but you're still letting your community engage with each other, and then when it comes time for that next conference again, they're going to want to be there because their friends are there, and these are people that they really know. Right. Uh, right. So that's where you know, I think that those two concepts can play really heavily in the event organizer category. Um, and maybe the last thing I would throw out there that I've been wanting to try with some of the event organizers is using the pin mail concept to not just focus on building on Pinterest, but to take the attendee lists that you have built up over the years or the contact lists and say, okay, here's your Facebook crowd, here's your Pinterest crowd, here's your Twitter crowd, and then enable those event organizers to share out the content they're generating over time or curating to the right platform for the right user through email marketing and maximize the virality of that content so that you can grow your audience faster. So I think that would be a really interesting concept, playing it out over 3, 6, 12 months. Uh, just because the growth numbers we've seen there, even in short periods of time, are substantial. So I can only imagine how they keep building as you get out to the, you know, the next year. Right. Well, I, you know, it's interesting because um, Social Media Tulsa started as a meetup group. Right, and we kind of became a conference, so um, so we have the luxury of meeting on a regular basis, right. and sometimes it's different people, and we're you know very social, you know we're more social than media. I always like to say, <laughs> yep. we're very social. But you know the need to have the conference came out of okay, every time we get together, we're just kind of having a good time. So we need to actually put in some of the education and training and. And you know, bigger you know venue networking kind of stuff. But yep. you know, all year long, we're kind of building you know the community. And I always tell people, once you're a part of Social Media Tulsa or SM Tulsa community, you're you're part of it. You know, regardless of whether you came in through the Facebook page, the Meetup page, um, an actual tweet up, or the conference, you're part of the community. So I try to have places where people can go. Uh, and I do have a you know social media it's also a conference board, but I think it might even be possible to or you know possible for me to just create a whole new Pinterest account for the brand SM Tulsa yep. so that you know people can connect and stay connected there and maybe even suggest boards to create and maybe even have members create their own boards there because I mean we do have people who are members of social media Tulsa because we have a meetup group. So, um, and they're usually the ones bringing in people to the conference and telling everybody about it, and right. so that's a good idea. So if you want to do it, I'm, I'm, I'll be the guinea pig. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we could definitely work on that. I mean, what I would do for, for an SM Tulsa account is every board that, you know, that I think of as being media related, being sharing information on given topics, I would invite people to contribute to every single one of those boards because okay. it sort of becomes like, LinkedIn groups at that point mm -hmm. where I mean I, I have I, I'm in a ton of LinkedIn groups most of them are okay but there are a few that are incredible and have great content mm -hmm. and the members are actively really carefully curating good content for those boards or those groups and so I think you'll get that same effect on the SM Tulsa boards and then you know the really interesting thing in terms of growing the community over time is that when each of those members pins to the board you're getting exposure now to their audience as well as your own, right? right. Uh, right. And that's going to bring more people in as they follow the board and then up, you know, upgrade to following the entire account or following additional boards. Right. Uh, so that's the really unique element of Pinterest is that in a way, I mean, the way I, I thought about it early on is, well, you had these companies that would create like 15 Twitter accounts for different topics right. because if you follow a Twitter stream, 
you have to follow everything in that Twitter stream. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing about Pinterest is you have the flexibility to not do that, and that's somewhat built into Google Plus as well, which is mm -hmm. which is cool. But on Pinterest in particular, as user accounts age, they tend to follow boards more and accounts less. Mm -hmm. So they become very picky about what gets in their stream or what doesn't. And in that way, you can have one Pinterest account that serves a similar purpose to 15 Twitter accounts in terms of letting people pick which subjects are interesting to them and following only those, except the distribution is a lot easier because it's all packaged in one nice place. Funny you should yeah. say that because I'm in the purging Twitter account <laughs> mode. <laughs> right, yeah. I had, you know, I had Twitter account for personal and then business and then now Social Media Tulsa because I felt like you know people who were following me as an event person didn't necessarily want to follow me talking about Tulsa all the time and yep. and of course my dog tweets and <laughs> so <laughs> you know so you know I have to oh my goodness there's the one that's that's trying to get in the house but <laughs> but um, yeah so it's like you know one account just doesn't get any attention right it just kind of you know, I I try to revive it for things, and it's just kind of there. And right. uh, but I I get that Pinterest would be better to have the different boards, and if people will follow the boards that are interest of interest to them, without having to follow everything, right? If you right. if you're one of those people that wants you know Twitter to go away, you don't get it, then don't follow the board where people are talking about what's happening on Twitter or sharing right. their favorite you know Twitter fail. Images. <laughs> well, and we had that same problem when I was at YouTube. That you know, you had a lot of these YouTube stars who wanted to start spin-off accounts uh, on different topics or or just a different style of content, and they knew their entire audience wouldn't be interested in it. But they wanted a way to be able to kind of at least present that content to their audience, and it took a lot of work. They would have to do all these cross promotional videos, and they'd have to you know, in every video description put in, go check out my second channel and all of that stuff. And I think, and the same was, is true through all the multiple Twitter accounts situation and the multiple Facebook fan pages and yada, yada, yada. Pinterest is the first network, I think, that really elegantly solved that problem yeah. by it, it packaging all of your content in one place but enabling people to choose what they actually want. And right. I actually think that was part of the secret of their explosive growth is that the stream was just more relevant for people mm -hmm. uh, because you know when I, I I'm on TweetDeck all day but when I look at my Twitter stream honestly these days maybe one in twenty tweets actually catches my eye and might be interesting when I'm scanning through it because there's just so much noise in that stream mm -hmm. um, but when I look at my Pinterest stream it's more like one in four uh, mm -hmm. images that catch my eye and, and part of that's just also being so visual so uh, I think that's part of why it grew so quickly is people are just finding the right content for them much more easily right right wonderful okay so before we go sure. um, can you give us a little bit of insight of what you're going to share when you're in Tulsa in a few weeks Sure. So, uh, well, I guess the first thing I'll throw out there is every presentation I give, I like to be interactive, and I like to let the audience sort of choose their own adventure. So what I'm going to do is probably prepare three or four topics and come in and say, these are the topics I prepared. You tell me which ones are interesting, and we're going to spend the time on that. So I guess that's the first thing. But in terms of those specific topics, you tend to get different audiences who need different content or want different content. So I think one content or one topic is probably going to be discussing a little bit about what Pinterest is beyond the superficial mm -hmm. and digging into how it differs from Facebook and Twitter and other social platforms so that you can really understand why and how your strategy on Pinterest needs to be different. From there I think the natural segue is well okay I'm interested in trying Pinterest or I'm convinced I have to be on there now how do I get started and walking through almost a recipe for this is how you can develop your Pinterest strategy uh, this is the data you should look at in advance and, and giving a really tactical guide to getting started. Then I like to get into sort of the bigger maximizing growth and maximizing ROI topics, getting into some of the hidden tricks behind the platform, some advanced strategies that the biggest brands are using, and that way if you have a more advanced audience in the crowd, they're still getting some really interesting, helpful tips out of that that they can go and, uh, and implement right away 
And if you've got the beginner crowd, they're at least thinking, wow, that's interesting. That's something I want to do in three months or six months. Um, so I'm thinking those are maybe the three major topics. Um, and I like to kind of mix case studies into all of those, too, in real-life examples. So I think that you know, those might be the ones I come prepared with, unless a fourth one strikes me before then. <laughs> and uh, then maybe we'll end up with a fourth surprise topic as well. That's awesome. Well, I mean, I, I, I talked to you the other day or emailed you about uh, changing your time. And mostly it's because I want to make sure that I put you in a time where the majority of the people can, can hear what you have to say, because I think this is a, right. a great topic. So um, I should have my decision <laughs> by the end of the week on what time you're going on. Uh, cool. But uh, we'll definitely make sure that you get, get a good crowd of people that, uh, that want to hear. And I know after this, this uh, hangout, you'll, you'll, your session will be packed anyway. <laughs> awesome. Sounds good. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, oh, Daniel. Sure. I, I forgot to mention I'm going to bring bribes too. I've got the our little mascot, Squishy guy here. Uh, so uh, he's going to be making an appearance, and he's a very strapping young lad. So uh, what if is you his want name? to meet does him, does he have a name? He doesn't have a name yet. We actually we need a name. Uh, we were thinking of maybe even just running a social contest in order to name him. Uh, so right now he's like Captain No Name or something. Uh, but we we need a name for this guy. So if anyone watching has a suggestion for a name, you know, tweet it at us or send us an email at uh, help at pinleague.com or something. But, uh, I love it. He'll, he'll be making an appearance as well. Fantastic. <laughs> the superhero with no name. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. I appreciate it. Thanks, Cheryl. Appreciate it.